we're really happy to have Dr. Douglas Dietrich with us today, a great friend to the Mount Sinai Morningside, Mount Sinai West Department of Medicine. Dr. Dietrich is, is professor of medicine, also the director of the Institute for Liver Medicine and director of outpatient hepatology, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And additionally, is an adjunct professor of medicine at the Department of Medicine at NYU's Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Dietrich received his Bachelor of Science from Yale and then completed his MD at NYU University School of Medicine, followed by internship, residency, and fellowship in gastroenterology, all at the Bellevue Hospital Center, uh, which was a wonderful, wonderful place for, to train Dr. Dietrich. And we, we, over the course of our grand rounds, we'll often hear stories about, about that wonderful center and all the great work that was done and continues to be done there. He has really been a champion and an advocate and a leader in, in all things hepatitis for decades now. And for example, still serves and has for many years as the chair of the scientific advisory for the Greater New York chapter of the American Liver Foundation and is the past president and chair of the Hepatitis Resource Network across the country. As I say, he's really been a champion and I really, it was such a pleasure for me, Dr. Dietrich, to review your CV again and remind myself of all the great work you did. For example, in the early days of, of the HIV crisis in New York City and later in really helping us understand who was at risk for co-infection with hepatitis C and who was at risk for hepatitis B infection as well. He's been a champion in bringing therapeutics to bear for our patients and for communities. And he's been a champion really in education and helping us to think fully about what it means to be at risk for hepatitis, what it means to be infectious with one of the hepatitis and how to get patients to a better place in terms of their futures and their care. Again, Dr. Dietrich, we're so grateful for the friendship that you extend to the department. It's truly really wonderful for have, to have you with us today and welcome. Great, thank you, <clears throat> and thanks for your um, for your friendship in return, Samuel. I'm delighted to to help. We all try to be on the same team, but actually, as I said in the faculty meeting yesterday, I spoke to Brendan Carr, uh, the the new head of the emergency departments. You know, the entire group, and he says he has, he says, you know, there's a one thing about taking over one company and then trying to merge the. Uh, um, you know, the, the corporate culture. But he said all seven emergency departments do things entirely differently. So it's like, it's like taking over seven different corporations and trying to merge their, uh, <laughs> their corporate cultures and try to get everybody to do things in, in the same way. So uh, it's, it's a challenge, uh, it's a challenge, but I'm glad we're all doing well on, in our each individual. Um, <clears throat> Um, markets until we can figure out how to how to do it all together. Okay, let me see my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, can you see this? Yeah, perfect. Very good. Great. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, hepatitis B is. Um, is indeed easy to treat. We got lucky, um, but it's very hard to understand. And actually, uh, on, a, on a personal note, it's very interesting. Um, the, um, the the father of nucleotides, tenofovir, adafovir, cytofovir, um, John Martin uh, died last week. Uh, actually, you know, suddenly. Um, I think he was still in his, in his uh, late 60s. Um, he brought um, nukes, nucleotides to uh, Gilead from Bristol Myers Squibb, who didn't want them. So he, um, they had a political argument. So he took the nucleotide patents with him to Gilead as his uh, um, uh, <clears throat> retirement gift or departure gift anyway. And so it was about a $30 million uh, gift that they gave him because they didn't understand the, uh, the importance of nucleotides in treating HIV and, and hepatitis B. Anyway, <clears throat> worldwide, um, these numbers are always kind of low, but about three and a half percent of the world is infected with it. Um, 
globally, it's probably about a billion people. Um, actually, not not 300 million. Um, but I think this is the main thing here. About 900,000 people, say a million people, uh, die every year globally of hepatitis B. Scary numbers. Um, despite the availability of vaccines to prevent it and antivirals to treat it. Now, this is some interesting science. Um, the paradox of hepatitis B. Um, uh, evolution. So this was a mummy. This was uh, discovered in um, uh, Italy. And it's about an eight year old child. And everyone assumed what happened here. Uh, it seems like you left the presentation. That's not my arrow. Oh. It's, it's someone else. Um... Oh, someone is sharing their screen. Let me fix that. Sorry. Can you share your screen again? Sure. If I can get rid of this. You can share your screen. It's fine. I, I, you are allowed. I'm view, we're viewing Judith, Judith Axelrod. So. Yeah, yeah. I already stopped the the screen okay. sharing. You can, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Sorry for that. Thought it was a a, a, a hacker. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for that rescue. Uh, so this is a mummy they found about. Um, uh, it looks like it's about six hundred years old. Uh, they just assumed the. Uh, the child died of smallpox because of these skin lesions. Um, but they actually did the um, DNA analysis for uh, variola virus, which was uh, negative. Um, and, uh, and here's the mummy actually wrapped up. Uh, and then they started doing other viruses and they did hepatitis B and they got indeed hepatitis B DNA. So this, this child probably died of an overwhelming infection of hepatitis B, which frequently results in um, antigen antibody complex disease. So causing these uh, skin lesions. So this is where it was from Naples, um, just south of, uh, of Pompeii and Herculaneum. So they got all excited and said, yay, we have this, this virus that's 600 years old now. Um, the Italian virus, and uh, about the same age, about this, about interestingly enough, about an eight-year-old child was was uh, they found a mummy in Korea. Uh, they did a laparoscopic liver biopsy and sequenced that virus as well. And basically, there's no difference. So in 600 years, same virus is is now in New York, uh, is in Italy. Is, Korea, is in Korea. So they could not do paleo virology and try to guess when the virus actually came into, um, um, into humans. So <clears throat> it's just genotype D um, uh, virus. Then actually um, a, a year later, um, ancient skeletons were discovered in um, and what is now Germany, um, <clears throat> there were quite a few of them. And these were not mummified. These were skeletons uh, in a mass grave. And actually all of them had hepatitis B. And these were about 17,000 years old. Um, and so they did the DNA on these folks and there was only a tiny difference in 17,000 years uh, in the DNA. So, it, and actually there was a slight sequence homology to simian or gorilla hepatitis B. So um, it looks like um, 
they're not going to be able to give us a, a solid number on when this virus entered entered humans. It looks like um, probably hepatitis B came out of Africa with us, as we you know human the human race came out of Africa and went you know north uh, and and east. Um, Hepatitis B accompanied us. It's been part of us ever since. Um, this is USPSTF screening recommendations. Um, household and sexual contacts. This is the, this is the virus that is actually um, easily spread within households. So I'll tell you a story about that. Um, one of my patients comes to me, he's a Columbia student. Um, and he uh, comes from Chicago uh, for hepatitis B treatment. And uh, he, he, I said, how did you get it? You know, uh, you should have been vaccinated. He said, yeah, I was, I got one shot. But uh, when I heard his parents were um, partners at a big law firm and they, when he was born, his, um, they, they decided to hire a Haitian nanny to take care of uh, him and his older sister who was like six or seven. And after about two months, everyone in the household had hepatitis B. Mom and dad, big sister, and um, little brother who was, who was a newborn at that point. And um, they all cleared it except for the newborn, which uh, is another, another point. Actually, if people get hepatitis B as a child or as a newborn, they almost never clear it. Um, whereas if you get old, as you get older, you do clear it. So he had like a billion IUs, um, this guy. Now he didn't meet any ASLD guidelines, which are stupid. Uh, but I wasn't about to unleash, uh, an 18 year old freshman into the Columbia population with, um, a billion copies of hepatitis B. So if his roommates or his, uh, dating partners, uh, did not get, um, vaccinated, and it appears to not, not to be mandatory at Columbia, then, you know, this would be an epidemic in the making. So we treated them right away. Um, so USPSTF, as you know, is a very conservative organization. We have a paper that we're about to submit where we're going to, uh, a very large group of uh, infectious disease and hepatologists uh, have just said, everybody, just like with HIV and hepatitis C, every adult needs to be screened for um, hepatitis B. Because like I said, lots of people who might have missed their vaccines or lots of people were born before 1991. Um, all pregnant women need to be screened with every pregnancy, actually. Uh, and of course we can treat them. We're very lucky to have um, uh, Tatiana Kushner, who's doing women's liver disease at the West Clinic, liver clinic on Wednesdays. Uh, and uh, she actually just uh, got a grant to do uh, hepatitis C treatment in pregnant women, um, uh, you know, as well, hepatitis C treatment. Hepatitis B treatment now is easy in pregnant women. Um, anything over 2000 I use, uh, and then we use either tenofovir or TAF, because in tecovir uh, is is a category C in pregnancy. Uh, and the same thing when we're treating young women of childbearing age, uh, for whatever reason, for hepatitis B, we use tenofovir or TAF because they're category um, B and considered to be generally safe in pregnancy. Okay, so I mean, this is this, and there's one other slide that are the ones that you really have to remember. Actually, so this, this is the most important study in, in hepatitis B. Um, this is the REVEAL study done in Taiwan. Um, and this is just the overall big look, um, looking at surface antigen negative people versus surface antigen positive people. And you can see the survival uh, is significantly less just having S antigen. But the, but the, real, the real REVEAL is over here on the right side of the screen um, where we look at HPV DNA levels here. And actually, by the way, these are in copies. So th this translates to 2000, um, uh, well, 
this translates to 200,000. Um, and this translates to, um, you, know, you know, divide by five, by about 20,000. So here's the line for the, the brown line for less than 300, no difference in survival. And the blue line, basically less than 2000, um, no difference in survival. But once you hit orange, 10,000 copies or 2000 IUs, then um, you do have a significant decrement in survival. So this is the point at which we think everyone should be treated. Um, it just makes sense. I mean, you can look at the survival. You know, obviously, the more virus uh, over time, the the lower the survival. So I think that's the point. Treat the virus here before it gets to here. Um, and now, and and these folks actually continued this this study. And if you've heard people in the past say. Uh, call people inactive hepatitis B carriers. Um, don't do that because there's no such thing um, as an inactive carrier. If you look at these numbers, cumulative hazard of progression to H to liver cancer. Here, this is in, in red here, so-called inactive, inactive hepatitis B carrier. Look at the difference here. And then over here, this is um, inactive HPV carriers, um, the cumulative hazard of liver-related death. So, the, so there's no reason to use this word carrier anymore. It's really kind of ridiculous. The NIH just did a study in the hepatitis B research network trying to categorize all the patients. I think there were six or 8,000 patients in this group into the, the four old categories. Um, and only 40% of them could be categorized into the old four categories, including inactive carriers. So what does that tell you about the, um, um, about, about those, uh, though, that way of thinking about it? So these are carriers. Okay, these are carriers. These are carrier pigeons and they're extinct. So don't, don't say carrier when it comes to hepatitis B. This is, these are the, uh, the easel guidelines, which we're getting closer to uh, adopting. Um, you can see the old terminology here was inactive carrier, uh, but E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients either have chronic infection or they have chronic hepatitis. And whether they have infection or hepatitis is determined by their ALT. Nowhere in that reveal study was the ALT measured as a, as a significant factor in survival. The only thing that was significant was DNA. Um, so we don't use the, this is the old ASLD terminology, which is still being used. We're, we're actually writing new, new guidelines right now, uh, simplified hepatitis B treatment guidelines, because these kind of guidelines um, dissuade people from treating people uh, who need to be treated. So there's basically one rule for treating hepatitis B. There's no hard and fast rules. Okay, you can't just stick to the rules because the hepatitis B didn't read the rule book. Um, we're fortunate that um, we have lots of drugs now uh, <clears throat> that, are, um, that are approved for hepatitis B. Uh, it, it was discovered in 1963, the so-called Australia antigen, but it was actually really Baruch Blumberg um, who made the discovery that made this possible. Um, and that's another good story. So he worked at the Fox Chase Cancer Center uh, in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, when you get a new, uh, um, instrument in medicine, you try it on everybody, right? You try it, you, when you're in the lab, you just, you know, do it on everybody. So well, he had um, new uh, SPEPs, serum protein electros, electrophoresis gels. Many of you remember doing those gels in biochemistry, uh, I'm sure in college or medical school. 
anyway, so he was running everything he could through gels to try to lo locate proteins. So he sent his lab tech across the street to a, um, uh, an institution for developmentally disabled uh, folks, and they were mostly uh, Downs uh, syndrome patients there. And he drew blood on everybody there, ran, the, ran all the columns, and lo and behold, everybody in the institution had the, had the, had the same protein spike in their, in their column. Uh, and he said, wow, this is really interesting, wrote the paper. He had identified the Downs syndrome protein. And just as he was about to send in the paper, his lab tech came in and said, Dr. Blumberg, uh, I have an admission to make and I'm also you know, not feeling well. And Blumberg rapidly diagnosed hepatitis because the guy's eyes were jaundiced and he looked really sick. Um, and, and he said, what's the confession? He said, I ran my own blood on the column yesterday, just out of curiosity. And I have the same protein spike as the, uh, all the folks from the, from the um, institution next door. So Lumberg made the, the, uh, the logical jump that um, his lab technician had not acquired Down syndrome and had indeed actually acquired um, hepatitis of some sort or another. So uh, he called the guys at Australia, asked them to send him a little Australia antigen ran it on his, um, on his uh, gels and lo and behold, same, same thing. Uh, so he actually, that was hepatitis B surface antigen. Um, and he was very lucky in many ways because uh, he didn't get hepatitis B, his lab tech did. Uh, he also got the Nobel prize very soon thereafter in terms of Nobel prizes. And, um, uh, the, the, uh, he was lucky because the hepatitis B virus makes an enormous excess of hepatitis B S antigen. And we, we haven't really understood why the virus would do that, such a smart virus that's been with us since we, uh, we came out of Africa um, until just recently. And we'll talk about that as we get to the new drugs. So, <clears throat> This is, a, this is the story. Um, adafavir, um, tenofovir and TAF are the nukes that John Martin was uh, responsible for. Um, and here's the timeline here. People did, were using interferon. They even tried, I don't think I have time to tell you the FIAU story but they tried another nuke of fluorinated uridine nuke, and it turned out to be a major disaster for the NIH. Um, I think nine out of 14 patients died or got liver transplants with that, with that nuke. Anyway, um, so we've got lots of options. Let's think about how we want to treat this. We want to make the DNA go down. because yeah. obviously that's, that's the cause of, yeah. of, of the problem. Um, we hope for E antigen zero conversion. Uh, we want to make the DNA undetectable because if it's not replicating, the patient shouldn't be um, contagious and shouldn't be getting any complications. Um, and then our, you know, the sort of one of the holy grails here is to clear S antigen. That's when we think we can stop uh, treatment. And then getting CCC DNA out of the cells would be an enormous step because that's a, uh, like a mini chromosome. And then finally, clearing the cells of the integrated DNA because hepatitis B integrates into the DNA of hepatocytes. So these are all the drugs, but the only drugs we, we can reasonably use are entecavir, um, tenofovir, and TAF, <laughs> sorry. Um, some people just use interferon occasionally to try to clear S antigen. I don't think that's gonna be, uh, have a big, have a great future. Um, <clears throat> this is really important to understand and it's a little bit um, silly also, 
But one of the uh, one of the things that's uh, the most deadly in hepatitis B is liver cancer. And there's a great debate as to who should be screened for liver cancer. So they keep trying to narrow it down when I think we should just screen everybody who has had a DNA level, frankly. So age over 40, if you're an Asian male, um, but age over 50, if you're an Asian female, if you're exposed to aflatoxin, that would be your African um, male usually. Uh, and then you would actually start screening for HCC uh, at age 20. Obviously alcohol and smoking, genotype C, uh, co-infection, uh, basal core promoter mutations, uh, high S antigen level. We, we can't really get that because of our, our lab, high DNA level, of course, and, uh, and cirrhosis. So it's very easy to screen for hepatitis B. Um, it's in all the guidelines. Uh, it's, alpha, it's alpha feed of protein every six months and, eight, and ultrasound every six months, unless the patient has cirrhosis. And then um, we alternate with MRIs. So, so um, it does look like there may be some benefit to preventing liver cancer if you treat uh, hepatitis B. And this is actually a kind of an old paper from 2015. It's five years old. This is uh, using, this using tenofovir in non-serotics observed number of um, a liver cancers here in the dots and they're predicted based, based on the reach B model here. So it looks like there's definitely um, uh, a, a benefit. This is using Intecavir at academic and private practices over four years, same study, uh, definitely better uh, risk of HCC. If you're taking medicine, hello, not a shock. This just came out in 2020 at EASL, uh, or the virtual EASL. They, they actually looked at tenofovir versus entecavir on post-operative recurrence-free and overall survival of patients with hepatitis B-related HCC. You have no idea how many patients we get referred from our hepatobiliary surgical oncology group um, to treat their hepatitis B after they've treated their hepatitis their, their hepatoma, either resected it or, or did something else to it. So it does look like actually tenofovir is a better drug than entecavir at uh, preventing recurrence uh, free survival. So that's kind of good news. We use a lot of tenofovir, although there is a risk of renal toxicity uh, as patients get older. So you have to be careful. Just a word on reactivation. Any, um, anybody uh, with a core antibody basically is subject to reactivation. So that's really important to remember. And remember when you're screening for hepatitis B in anybody uh, who walks in the door, and frankly, we should make it everybody who walks in the door, there are three things that you have to do. You've got to do three lab tests if your lab is working unlike ours, have to do hepatitis B surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody. Got to do core as well, because if you, if, you, um, if you don't do core, you won't know this, and then patients who get treated with um, immunosuppressive agents, rituximab being the, the main offender, will have a liver failure. And lots of times they come in here, we see at least two a month, I think, um, from outside oncology groups come in with liver failure from hepatitis B reactivation because they never tested them or they never um, prophylaxed them. And there was one malpractice case that um, they asked me to, to consult on where the, uh, an oncologist in, uh, at Albany, a hepatologist at Albany and an oncologist at the Dana-Farber all did hepatitis B screening and all missed the fact that the patient <laughs> had hepatitis B. And by the time uh, they figured out, 
he was already in liver failure uh, and, and gotten, uh, ended up with a liver transplant and then didn't do well after that. Now, this is a new uh, thing, particularly in, in, in Europe, uh, and people are thinking about stopping nucleotide or nucleoside therapy um, in some patients to see if they'll get a flare um, and then they can clear their S antigen because of the um, immune response. I'm not really big on that. Um, I'm happy to stop people's treatments at when their S antigen goes away. So that's when, that's when people you know, I'll ask you, I don't want to take this medicine for life. You don't have to take it for life. You just have to take it until your S antigen becomes a S antibody or goes away. So I show them that on the lab and say, okay, think about this. Use your, uh, use your T cells to clear this virus out. So this functional cure that we're thinking about uh, clearly would have a benefit. Um, off therapy sustained su suppression uh, S antigen zero conversion, maybe CCC DNA inactivation, uh, although they would still have risks under immunosuppression and it seems feasible. And then of course the, the real holy grail here is S antigen zero conversion, CCC DNA eradication and integrated HPV DNA um, removed from the um, hepatitis B genome. People have been using um, CRISPR uh, to try to attempt that actually in the laboratory. Now, we go back to S antigen and Blumberg, how Blumberg got so lucky. Uh, S antigen, just to be uh, tested positive, um, uh, you have to have a million particles per cc, per ml. So he was really lucky there was so much, but then we're thinking why a smart virus would do this. Well, it looks like hepatitis B figured out that if it threw so much antigen, so much of this uh, S antigen out there, that the body would be overwhelmed or shocked and awed basically by this. Uh, and it overwhelms the uh, both B and T cell um, immunities. Okay, so uh, this was a good idea in Agravir. Uh, works for the rig eye system uh, through modulation of the innate immune system. These are always uh, dangerous, actually, because this drug was withdrawn due to liver toxicity. So these, there's lots of drugs on the way, but lots of them fall by the wayside. Um, and this is very complicated stuff to think about, but it's actually kind of exciting because it gives us so many um, ways to try to inhibit hepatitis B um, and, uh, and perhaps remove it from the hepatocyte. So here's where the um, virus enters the hepatocyte through um, an NTCP receptor. Um, there's a, caps, there's a uh, capsid inhibitor uh, that helps or that uh, actually will inhibit this, this capsid from being um, un uncoated, but its job is then actually to get into the nucleus uh, where there's DNA here uh, and the DNA actually helps to repair the CCC DNA, which then is responsible for transcription, translation that comes out of the nucleus so you can inhibit, use capsid inhibitors down here. Um, you can use RNA destabilizers here. You can use SI RNAs um, here uh, <clears throat> to interfere with the translation. And you can actually measure the effect by looking at pre-genomic RNA, which is <clears throat> um, kind of a, uh, a great marker that we can look at. Um, if you have core uh, assembly and packaging, the, ca the capsid or the core inhibitors will interfere with this. This is where the uh, nucleoside analogs work here in DNA synthesis. Um, and then um, the, uh, the virus goes through the uh, Golgi apparatus and then 
back out. Um, uh, it's complicated, but there's lots of ways to actually uh, to go after it then. Um, the really interesting thing is this drug, Merclid XP, uh, this is used with interferon, you can use it by, by yourself, is also is very active against Delta hepatitis, uh, for which we really haven't had anything except for interferon. As you can see, the Delta RNA um, drops dramatically here. And interestingly enough, it was acquired by Gilead this year to add to their antiviral uh, portfolio. So we'll be seeing a lot more of this. And as I said before, the, um, the benefit of this drug is it also blocks entry through this receptor here, as well as um, inhibits delta replication. Now, core inhibitors block viral replication and that the most, most companies are making core inhibitors now. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things is that the trafficking to the nucleus of the, of the core, hepatitis B core with the DNA coiled in it here is really important um, to maintain the integrity of the CCC DNA. So oh, um, they did a really elegant experiment. Uh, this is Assembly, uh, the guy who invented Intecavir. Uh, uh, they looked at CCC DNA, pregenomic RNA, in viruses who had a source of resistance, uh, which was shown to actually be in the CCC DNA. And they went back and looked at liver biopsies from earlier studies of hepatitis B uh, drugs like um, lamivudine and telbibidine where there were biopsies um, present. And they found that um, the turnover by, by looking at, at the, the rate at which the resistance mutations went away when they stopped the drugs. So the turnover of CCC DNA from sensitive uh, on from, yeah, from resistant to sensitive occurs somewhere about 12 to 16 weeks. So we, we, we really never knew how long this lasted. We thought it could be centuries and then it could be a few days, but now it looks like it, um, it's about 12 to 16 weeks. So that's a rapid turnover of both pregenomic RNA and CCC DNA pools. So if we can inhibit, um, and there's no evidence of an inactive subpopulation. So all CCC DNA is, um, is, uh, is active here. So when you're using a core modulator here in this study, um, residual viremia is not eliminated by nuke if you go down to a, a, um, an assay that's, uh, that's less than five um, IUs. Here, but when you use the combo, actually, um, be, uh, everybody has negative uh, DNA except this one guy who is a slow responder. Although you can see his his blots are getting um, much more, uh, much more, much less pronounced over here. So, combo treatment gets the the virus down to less than five. Um, by using this um, core inhibitor. This is just a, a, an eyeball, a quick eyeball thing. There's so many of these drugs. It's similar to the race for hepatitis C, although much more difficult, of course, because um, this is gonna be a much more difficult virus to cure. And lots of, you know, several of these drugs have already gone by the wayside. This is another way to attack it, actually. With, um, with siRNA, there's Galnac siRNA here. And this is one of the reasons the virus has survived so long because it has these overlapping reading frames here. Um, so when it makes a mistake, it fixes it. Um, and that's unlike HIV or hepatitis C where there's no proofreading. With hepatitis B, there's overlap and proofreading and so it's difficult to, um, to kill this virus completely. So if you design an siRNA that can get through all the 
on the surface antigen here, um, that would stop surface antigen production, presumably, which is a good thing because then it would allow the immune system to wake up. Uh, and on the other hand, if you, if you um, take a, a harder uh, target here, the X gene, and um, <clears throat> here you can actually, and then design the siRNA to cover one, two, three, four, five overlapping reading frames, then you could really um, inhibit the virus and maybe do both at the same time. And this was, this was the, the results of that, actually. It looks like the X uh, was, a better, was a better result. Um, this is RNA interference uh, using the J&J &J, uh, drug. These are mean S antigen reductions. So this is designed to inhibit S antigen. And this is, a, this is actually pretty impressive. It's two and a half logs uh, after four months. Um, so there, J&J &J is in this big time for combination therapy. Um, this, is, this is Arbutus. Um, they have a, a decent combination of drugs. Um, and this is actually the basic, this is the other, um, slide you should remember, actually, besides the reveal slide, this is our proposed new algorithm um, for, he for hepatitis B. Screen everybody, just like HIV and hepatitis C. If they're S antigen positive, then you need to follow up with uh, liver chemistries, DNA, hepatitis C and D, HIV, and of course, hepatitis A to get uh, vaccines going. Um, these are the groups that need Hep B treatment. Uh, <clears throat> anybody with cirrhosis and DNA, it doesn't matter what level DNA, they need to be treated. If they're over 30 and their DNA is over 2,000. If they're less than 30, their DNA is over 2,000 and their ALT is elevated. And then, of course, if they have hepatitis uh, C, D, or HIV. Um, I think I, you have to, oops, sorry, I have to add my bad here, sorry. Uh, add um, TAF to this uh, here. And then the groups that need monitoring, DNA less than 2000, you still have to screen them for HCC. Um, if the ALT is low, uh, this is less than 30. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, no reason. If somebody's 28 or 29 has a risk in their family. So for instance, I saw a, um, like a 30 year old Filipino woman and um, she had a low viral load. Um, yeah, she was over 2000, she was like 10,000, but she didn't want to be treated. Uh, so we kept, we kept following her and uh, watching the viral load and screening for HCC every, um, every six months. And then finally she sends me a my chart message and says, Doc, I need to talk to you about my brother back in the Philippines. He has a liver cancer. So I said, uh, we'll talk tomorrow. Get your ass in here because we're gonna write you a prescription for hepatitis B treatment right away because that's a huge risk. Having a first degree relative uh, is a huge risk for, um, for liver cancer. So we succeeded in getting her treated. And these are the, the directions at the bottom here. When can you stop? Loss of S antigen, uh, consolidation for a year, normal ALT, persistently undetectable hepatitis B. And then of course you have to keep watching because people do zero revert. Um, <clears throat> So this is the Europeans, again, trying to stop nucleoside analogs. I'm not big on that. But um, for patients who have a low S antigen level here, less than 1,000, uh, it's feasible. Um, about 30% uh, about of people uh, eight in this study lost their S antigen after uh, stopping nukes and having a flare. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not real happy about flares. Um, here's an X targeting HBV RNA, and you can see 1.5 logs drop in 12 weeks uh, in S antigen. That's huge. Uh, this is two monthly doses. 
um, were given uh, subcutaneously. Um, and that's a, that's a huge amount. So the idea is you use this with another uh, antiviral with a different mechanism of action. Uh, you lower the S antigen, allow the immune system to wake up and then have the core modulator take out the inside of the virus. This is on a Roche uh, phase one study, um, also looking at uh, oligonucleotides. Um, and you can see here uh, with at four weeks, um, there was about a 0.4 drop. So it looks, sorry about that. Um, it's well tolerated and it looks like there may be some uh, engagement. This one is more interesting. This is the assembly. Um, hepatitis B core inhibitor. Uh, we did this study actually. Um, assembly looks like it's really got its stuff together. They, um, they took basically the whole Gilead virology core group with them, John McCutchinson, uh, Bill Lee, um, and a couple of the clinical people all, all went over to, um, to assembly. So 24 weeks of treatment with assembly 731 and a nuke produced a higher proportion of E antigen patients achieving DNA uh, treatment non-detectable by highly sensitive assays. I've got about three of these, three of my six or eight patients who still, we stopped the drugs actually, and they're still DNA, they're still DNA is less than 2000. So that's very promising uh, uh, that, that it can happen like that. We're, so we're hoping, we're still early stages. I'm telling my patients three to four years. Here's the bad news. Chronic hepatitis B in the US, not 70% are not aware of their hepatitis B. 2.5% are in care and re receive treatment. Um, you know, there's about 3 million people in the US with hepatitis B and there's only 60,000 prescriptions written every year for hepatitis B treatment. Um, hepatitis B patients never monitored or not routinely monitored for ALT, 22%, DNA, 60%, and of course, liver histology. Um, and then finally, never receiving or undergoing uh, HCC surveillance. Look at this number makes me crazy. 78% without cirrhosis, 62% with cirrhosis, even among patients adherent to HCC surveillance for one year up to 30% were not adherent at five years. So ultrasound AFP every six months, um, anybody who has S antigen, screen them. HCC surveillance is recommended for all, just say all uh, chronic hepatitis B patients. So hep B is a very dynamic disease. Antiviral therapy that's available now can suppress DNA, reduce inflammation, normalize ALT, and histology reverse fibrosis. This is the most remarkable thing. <clears throat> Decompensated liver disease and hepatitis B goes away when you treat it. I have a bunch of little old ladies uh, that came in with ascites and edema and now are fine. Reduce the risk of liver cancer. Um, it's controllable. TAF is a great new drug. The risk of HCC is lowered but remains, especially in people who start uh, treatment with significant cirrhosis. Cure is on the horizon. Looks like it's going to require multiple drugs with multiple mechanisms of action, um, both antiviral and immunostimulators. So this is our goal, actually, is to make hepatitis history. So happy to um, happy to discuss and answer any questions. I think we have about ten minutes left for. Um, that, that is highly correct. intelligent questions. That is correct, Dr. Lee. So whoever wants to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourselves and just pose a question. There's no questions on the chat. Before you uh, pose your question, just remember to identify yourself, where you work, which department, what kind of, what kind of patients you see. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Dietrich will be happy to answer any questions. Dr. Dietrich, uh, thank you for an outstanding talk. It's Ira Mizels from the Division of Nephrology. Yeah. I was wondering if you could comment on the treatment of hep B in dialysis patients. That's actually no different. Um, we, we actually prefer to use TAF 
in those patients because there's 95 percent excreted in the liver and only five percent uh, in the kidneys so it actually doesn't even require any any changes uh, in the in in, in uh, you can use tenofovir and entecavir, and you just have to reduce the doses based on the GF, GFR, you know, the patients. Thank you. It, it, it's, it's very treatable. <clears throat> Any other question? Uh, uh, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm having computer problems this morning. I don't know if you can hear me, but anyway. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Good. But my question is, is are we screening populations sufficiently? And if not, how should that be done? Uh, the, first, the answer to the first question is no, clearly not. Because we're still seeing acute hepatitis B, you know, in people born before 1991. Um, and we're still seeing people with active hepatitis B, um, uh, even who were born after 91 and never got vaccinated. So how do we do that? I think we need to do like, hopefully things will work better this year because last year in May, National Hepatitis Awareness Month, um, both all the three, the USPSTF, um, the ASLD, and um, CDC recommended screening every adult for hepatitis C over age 18 or over. Um, we've already had the recommendation to do that for HIV. So I, th I think we need to do that uh, this year for hepatitis B. Maybe we can wait until um, July 28th, which is, at, which is World Hepatitis Day that happens to be Baruch Blumberg's birthday, um, actually, and try to make some kind of announcement. Our paper should be accepted by then where we recommend screen everybody, make universal screening for hepatitis B, part of the other screenings that we do with every primary care doctor, um, you know, and everybody else that uh, comes through. So screen for hepatitis B in all your, actually all your adult patients. If, and make sure they're vaccinated. And if they're not, um, hopefully we'll have um, um, a, um, your HEPLASAV vaccine on the, uh, in, in your formulary in a very short time. So Samuel says, what's the approach to hepatitis B and hepatitis C co-infected patients? And how big a problem is this internationally? Um, B and C patients, are it's not that big a deal. Uh, it's very important to treat the, uh, the B along with the C because if you don't, you can end up with a huge flare. And I think this, this has happened uh, and there's several papers about this. Um, it's interesting, the hepatocyte is only capable of making one virus efficiently at a time. And hep C usually uh, predominates. So if you've got uh, 5 million IUs of hep C, and there's 500 IUs of hep B. If you suddenly take away the hep C, then the hep B goes wild and can have a mm -hmm. flare, uh, you know, runs rampant. So you've got to just treat the hepatitis B at the same time as the hepatitis C. It's easy, like I said, in tecavir, tenofovir, or, or TAF. Um, internationally, this is not that big a problem, Samuel. Uh, hepatitis B is the problem. C is is is, is relatively uh, small, as far as we can tell. Although we really don't know what what the uh, prevalence of C is in um, in sub-Saharan Africa or in large parts of China. We have another two questions. Um, Dr. Glyptis from ID is asking why milk thistle reduces viral load. Uh, good question. It doesn't. It actually doesn't do anything. The NIH did a, a, a two-year study with uh, milk thistle versus placebo, um, and it turned out it didn't even reduce ALT. So it had no antiviral activity whatsoever. Maybe we should try hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry. <laughs> uh, we have another question from Dr. Gelman from Montai Morningside. He's asking who should be screened for Delta? Everyone who's positive for uh, surface antigen. Everybody who has hepatitis B basically should be screened for Delta. Now the clues that Delta is present is are if your patient is worse than, you, than you'd expect, um, if the DNA, if you can't get the DNA undetectable, it'll go low, but it won't be undetectable. And the liver enzymes will stay um, um, mildly elevated, even though the DNA is down in the less than a thousand range. So those are the patients that look like Delta. Most of the Delta patients we see now come from the former Soviet Union, um, the Caucasus, you know, all the stands down there on the, on the Southern tier. And actually the, the highest prevalence uh, of, of Delta is in Mongolia. And it's about 10% of the patients in Mongolia have, have, have hepatitis Delta. Uh, we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, Dr. Braun is asking, uh, how costly are the prescriptions and our insurance is covering them? Both, uh, both Entecavir and Tenofovir are, are now generic. Uh, so they're cheap. They're, they're, they're nucleus, they're nukes, they're cheap as dirt to manufacture. So that's never a problem. If you, for some reason, you wanna use TAF, uh, and we, we have about half our patients on TAF, um, we usually can get it approved uh, by insurance. So it's not a problem to treat. Um, Dr. Tupper is asking, uh, why do have B vaccines fail to immunize a certain number of patients? Yeah, because probably because, well, <clears throat> Uh, several reasons. Um, with, with the old vaccine, only half the people got the third shot after six months. So it didn't, didn't always work. Um, even with the, in the best of circumstances, it was only about 85% successful in terms of, of developing S antibody. Um, so if you don't de develop uh, S antibody, uh, you, could be, you could possibly um, be subject to getting uh, hepatitis B. That's why we, we like this Heplosav vaccine so much. Uh, with both shots, you get 95% efficacy and they're only one month apart. So the patient never forgets uh, to come back for the one month visit. Okay. Oh, and Dr. Braun again, I think this will be our last question um, before. 9 a.m. hits. Um, oh, it's, I think it's not a question, it's more of a comment. Um, yeah. A GI nurse failed to respond to the third round of vaccination. Well, I mean, it's, she's probably protected. Um, if you, I mean, with the old vaccine, what we would do if they failed is give them double dose vaccine and that worked in another five to 10% of people, uh, but now, I mean, if you're worried about it, you can give her a Heplosav, should be on the formulary there. I would try two shots of that. And if, and if she still doesn't develop antibody, I wouldn't worry about it. She probably is immune. Uh, she probably ha will have a great anamnestic uh, response to any, um, um, any kind of hepatitis B exposure. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. Appreciate it. Pleasure to see all you folks looking so healthy this morning. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and coming and talking to us about HEP-B. We surely needed it. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm pretty good with email. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Well, we have a great day.